What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. Oh yeah, first one of the year 2016. Thank you so much for listening. And here at Homebrewed Christianity, we want to bring you the best audiological ingredients. Put them right in your earbuds so that you can brew your own faith. That's right. We don't want to think for you. We want to think with you. And today on the podcast is the second half of the Jurgen Boltmann podcast. In it, you're going to hear from a whole host of voices you'll probably recognize. Yeah, people like Scott Pate, um, Philip Clayton will be on there. We're going to have uh, authors from the Homebrew Christianity Guide series joining us. And uh, Tony Jones and I are talking it up right there at the American Academy of Religion, talking about the crucified God, Jürgen Molman, and the impact that book has had on theology. So, booyah. But before we jump into that, I just want to tell you what's, what is headed your way in this, in this brand new year. We have interviews with some amazing people headed your way, like uh, Amy Sean, Roger Olson, Andrew Sun Park, Schubert Ogden, Catherine Keller, John Cobb, Walter Brueggemann, all coming at you in the next two months. Booyah! And if you are in the lovely state of California and you happen to be in the Bay Area on February 4th, I'm going to be at the GTU Graduate Theological Union, February 4th at 8 p.m., free podcast. That's right, live in the house with peeps from all the different schools at the GTU. But the Episcopalians are the ones that are hosting. And Heretic Brewing Company, one of my favorite breweries, is bringing the goods, drinkable goods, that is, so you'll get in free. You'll have a really sweet a homebrewed Christianity pint glass filled with Heretic Brewing Company stuff, and uh, then you'll come to a live podcast with a whole bunch of different guests and excitement. Mm-hmm. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky, uh, while I'm up there, I'm trying to I'm trying to work out a time to hang out with with the good Dr. Daniel Kirk and record a Lectio cast. So that might even happen too. Anyway, uh, that's coming up February 4th up in the Bay Area. Also, later in February, if you're going to be at Progressive Youth Ministry in Dallas, Texas, the 18th to the 20th, and, and who doesn't want to be there if you're a youth minister? Yeah, that's the coolest youth ministry uh, uh, event to go to. So if you're going to be there, no, there's going to be a homebrew Christianity podcast. Uh, Tony Jones and I are doing a, a theology breakout session, and on the 17th, Wednesday, the 17th, there is a Theology Nerd Boot Camp on Christology with Jorg Rieger and moi. That's right. I'm going to be talking about Jesus with Jorg Rieger on the 17th at Southern Methodist University Perkins School of Theology. It's a one-day event. You can get information at homebrewedchristianity.com. You can also, you know, just go to PYM, um, uh, the Progressive Youth Ministry website, and get all the details uh, for the big event, for the boot camp prior. Come on out. Have yourself a good time. And just just know, just know there's there's tons of other stuff headed your way, like uh, first week of March. Um, March 3rd, 4th, and 5th is Unfolding Theology here in Redondo Beach at the Hatchery where I'm working. But if you use the code HOMEBREWED, you get two extra days, like March 1st and 2nd with Jack Caputo before the whole big event on the 3rd, 4th, and 5th. So that's like five days of excitement. Yeah, go to unfoldingtheology.com. You can find out more. Then in April, I'm going to be in North Carolina for a whole bunch of different stuff. So anyway, uh, I'll be going around and about. And if you're going to be at any of them, just or at me, at Trip Fuller on Twitter, and say, like, oh, I'm going to see you at this and that. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is a discussion of the influence, the power, the magnitude of Jürgen Moltmann, his influence on theology, some reflections on the crucified God. If for some reason you missed the Jürgen Moltmann podcast, you should just go back and listen to it. And if you've already listened to it, it's always good to listen to it again. Mm-hmm. Because it was just it was just that amazing. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. Glad to be here in 2016, bringing you the best theology right into your earbuds. So holler back, holler at Twitter at Trip Fuller. Love to connect with you. We have a homebrewed Christianity Deacon Twitter list. If you're not on it, you should get on it because then you can just check it and look at what all the theology nerds are tweeting. And if you don't have Twitter, it's okay. No one's judging you out loud. All right. Peace. Ja, das, da German. muss man doch aufpassen. Jetzt geht's los, Leute. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like that. <laughs> no, I won't say it. Um, hey, Clayton. 
Hey, Joe. you were kind of pulling our leg on that toast. Yeah, he totally was. <laughs> I heard. I know a little German because I did. Okay, here's my here's my story with German. I I um I didn't want to spend the money at Princeton on the like the German class to pass the PhD. You are not in German bars. No, no, so, <laughs> right. So I did the Rosetta Stone software. I, like I bought it in the airport and did the Rosetta Stone over the summer. And then I went back to Princeton to take my German exam. And it's just in a blue book. They just give you a passage, say translate it in a blue book. And then Daryl Guter grades it. And so I got back the blue book and all it said in really small handwriting was low pass. (laughs) (laughs) Which in English is pass. Praise God. (laughs) Yeah, right. Uh, So I could tell I knew just enough German to know that you were pulling our legs. Yeah, I was saying all these totally personal things and hoping that nobody except Jürgen would really understand. And uh, also that German is very flowery and very, you know, traditional. And then obviously the English wasn't. <laughs> What's, what do you think the legacy of this book is 40 years on? Yeah, I think the pathos of God is um, returns God from scholastics back to the language of the Bible and to the language of devotion. And Moltmann gets a lot of credit for that. You can hear it in the interview, the way that he goes back always to the personal dimension, right? He was asked about hope, what form hope takes. What did he say? Protest. Mm -hmm. That's so sweet. He fights against the otherworldly. But we also should push Moltmann a little bit for what he didn't say and where he wouldn't go, right? I mean, especially where at the American Academy of Religion, where heresy is the name of the game. (laughs) <laughs> and, and where is that? Where wouldn't he go? Uh, in the book, he flirts with a really beautiful notion and then pulls back. He's willing to to speak of, um, or at least borderline speak of patripassianism, right? The passion of God. Um, but I, I actually think of the, the great debacle that you and Pete Rollins did recently, because Pete wants to speak of the God who is so God, who is so in Christ that he dies. And um, Pete wants the God to stay dead because then there's more to say. (laughs) (laughs) Just let that one hang for a minute. (laughs) And nobody answers back. But but what about a God who so fully does the kenosis of Philippians 2, right? And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And Moltmann goes to that point and pulls back without quite naming the precipice that he stood on and what the fear might have been that pulled him back. And that has been for me, since I first read the book, the disappointing moment. Interesting. Scott Paith, you're a molt maniac. Proudly. (laughs) Um, A hundred years, 200 years, does this book crucify God? Is this in the canon of 20th century theology? And why? Or Uh, why not? If... If it's not, I think that we've failed to recognize the the genuine significance that it has for the life of the church in the 20, 20th century and the way in which it influenced everything that came after it. Uh, that the traces of what Moltmann is up to in the crucified God can be seen throughout uh, liberation theology movements around the world. The story, of course, that uh, he told uh, earlier about the book falling from uh, John Sabrino's shelf uh, testifies to the significance that Moltmann's recapturing of the idea of God being present and experiencing the reality of the crucifixion as part of the divine being is absolutely essential to the way in which Christology has been reconceived um, and I think recovered in its fullest sense as a doctrine of God's suffering in the second half of the 20th century. So if we're not reading this book in 200 years because it still speaks to us 200 years from now, we should at least be reading it to understand how the church in the second half of the 20th century understood what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Great answer. One of the things that came up, uh, and for those of you that don't know, um, Scott and I did like a two-hour introduction to Moltmann's life and thought together 
uh, through our Epic Reads program at Homebrewed, which is like you're reading. It's like a great book series, but they're epic, so I can pick which ones seem cool to read. Um, and uh, and we did an introduction. And then the next month, Phil and I read Crucified God and, and walked through it together. Uh, and and if you forward bonus at tripfuller.com your receipt for my book or Moltmann's book, you'll get them both delivered to you in the next week. Um, yeah. The, I just got a text like, did you remind people you're giving free stuff? Um, so uh, one of the things that came up was how Moltmann's kind of introduction uh, to of, of the eschatological shape of Christian theology introduces God's sovereignty and identity or simultaneously God's essence and existence are up for grabs in history. That for God to be the good God that Israel proclaimed God to be, that Jesus called Abba, then uh, history can't have an arbitrary end. The cross can't be the last word about Jesus. And that hope is something more than uh, a sheer imminent plane. Can you, can you, both of you kind of reflect on just what happens when in constructive theology you displace some type of at least theological confidence in God being the one who is love. Because I think that part of the book was the most existentially striking for me today, thinking of the conversations we're about to have at AAR. Uh, for many, the God being the God who Jesus called Abba at the end um, is flippantly dismissed. What's being dismissed, or what's the challenge, or as, as, as Phil and I said, what's the most, uh, the, the best, most robust and disturbing version of Bardian insistence, um, uh, as expressed in Moltmann? <laughs> um, that's, that's, a, that's like such that's a classic a... trip question. <laughs> and then just pass the ball to me to yeah, try right. and answer it. Uh, I mean, I think, for me, if God is love, and this is what I think is at the heart of what Moltmann is about in The Crucified God. If God is love, there is no place that God can possibly be but the cross. That a God who is not in the midst of the experience of human suffering is a God who is not engaged in creation, is not involved with creation, and who therefore is less of a God than a God who is fully immersed in the reality of the creation which he declared is good and which he is attested throughout the Bible uh, to love. So I think that the only possible way for me as a Christian to understand the nature of God's love is understanding it on the basis of God's involvement in the cross. And this goes to the question of patripassionism that you were raising a moment ago. Could that mean, can we take the risk of, of implying that that means that God suffers the reality of the cross even to the point of death? And does Christ's experience, not only of death, but of descent in, descent to hell, get incorporated into the divine being in such a way that every dimension of human existence, all suffering, even to the point of damnation, is ultimately saved and redeemed in Jesus Christ. It's got a great answer. I'll meet you and raise you five. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the phrase God is love immediately gives rise to an idol and needs to be deconstructed in order to be heard. And that means not only love is expressed through um, a vicious ex execution, uh, it means that in those places that are the most violent, the most, the most filled with hatred and counter to love, love is manifest. The places that have nothing to do with our, with our understanding of a sort of romantic big hug love are the places where that word should be used. Mm -hmm. 
and that where you most expect a God whose very nature is to be compassionate and free from sin, free from any kind of impurity, the places you most expect such a God to be is in the places of the greatest violence and the greatest impurity. The tradition spent so much time protecting God from any impurity, making sure that he was in a safe place well away from we. And maybe we actually, and this is, this is, Moltmann gets credit for this. We actually need to understand God in the places where it's most impossible to understand God. Mm -hmm. And that sounds at first like a deconstruction of God, but maybe it's a saving of God. And I just want to add to that, um, one of my favorite lines from the crucified God, uh, and it's a longer passage, but, but the part that has always stayed with me is when he talks about only when the church, with all that it has in it, enters into all of the places where the absence of peace is organized, that it, that it reaches the point of crisis, and only at that point can it begin to genuinely discover the meaning of Christ's crucifixion. So one more sentence begs to be said at that. Um, it's the sentence from uh, Elie Wiesel, Night. It's the sentence that gets mentioned in this book, right? The, the people are called out of bed in Auschwitz and made to stand in the rows, and they're, uh, they're hanging a boy. And the uh, platform drops, and he's hanging there, but he's too light to die. It's too light to break his neck and cut the oxygen. And so it takes a long time. And people are agonizing to see this young Jewish boy dying slowly and brutally uh, by hanging. And the man behind Elie Wiesel says, um, where is God? Mm-hmm. And Elie Wiesel says, that's him. He's there. He's dying in that gallows. And that's the point that Moltmann didn't quite go to. And that I hear it, Scott, in your last answer, the willingness to say, in that place where God could not be, we rediscover God. One thing that he did say in that book that was out of step with some other theologies of the time and, and still today is that God is that Jesus dies for the oppressed and the oppressor. So let me ask this. This is, you know, we got four PhD straight white guys on this panel. Is, is Moltmann, is, does, is, there's a, there's a critique that Moltmann is letting the oppressor off too easily. And this critique implicates those of us, straight white guys with PhDs, who love this theology. Is, what do we need to attend to in that, in that, there's a feminist critique, a black critique, a marginalized theology critique of that, of that move Moltmann makes. What do you think of that? So I'll answer briefly in the beginning and then turn over to Scott for the real answer. Um, <laughs> uh, it's true that um, the, the depth of Philippians 2 belongs to those who can identify with verses 5 through 8, which I quoted before, even death on a cross. And those whose lives here on earth fit with 9 to 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted them and given them a great place as PhD white males. Um, that they're the ones who don't really comprehend that verse. And I just want to tell a story. So after this great performance on Homebrewed, um, Moltmann stepped back and a young theologian from the Global South came up and said, I have to tell you how much my work has been transformed by you. May I please have a picture with you? And took a picture and before Moltmann took off. The really important function of Moltmann hasn't been in Europe and the United States, but in Latin America and across Asia, in the third world or the global south. And so you could say he writes for those theologians and in his career and his trips, he helped give those women and men a voice. And he wrote for them more than he wrote for us. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you've just said. And I just want to add to that, that I think that for Moltmann, the important linkage between the liberation of the oppressed and the liberation of the oppressor uh, is precisely in the idea that just, justification for the oppressor 
is only possible in the context of justice for the oppressed. Mm -hmm. So this is not a form of cheap grace that says, well, you know, God, God has, God has died on the cross in Jesus Christ for you. And so therefore, um, therefore you don't have any obligation to work for justice. On the contrary, the only path to justification, to release from sin, for those of us who find ourselves voluntarily or involuntarily on the side of the oppressor is precisely in stepping out of that role and actively and self-consciously working for on behalf of justice for the oppressed. To do anything else, to claim justification without actively working on behalf of justice for the oppressed is to, is to betray that which we claim to associate ourselves with in our desire for justification in Jesus Christ. One of the things I was thinking of, uh, especially because Moltmann told the story about Sabrino and uh, kind of engaging the text and the, the blood of the martyr on the text, is like in Sabrino's work you see Moltmann's Christology picked up that the crucified God has a correlate and it's the crucified people. And that one of the moves in the late 20th century into the 21st century of theology is to recognize that the Bardian kind of emphasis on God's self-testimony in the cross, dead Jesus, uh, has a correlate in our history. And it's the crucified people of the present. Uh, and later in his work, it's our current crucifixion of the very good planet God has made. And in that kind of turn to me, is the most attractive part to what would otherwise be a rather Trinitarian uh, way too orthodox to make my Claremont self uh, comfortable um, uh, theology. And when, when, when Phil and I were talking about uh, the text, uh, we talked just at how much pressure it puts on you when you're recognizing how it is you're walking away or parting with the tradition. And the creative possibilities as theologians not only include and are transformed by the voices of the global south and the oppressed and the crucified people of today, but also uh, rehear and re-engage the voices of the tradition that we're tempted uh, to ignore. Um, can you, because I know both of you do political theology and you have organic Marxism as, your, as, as a new book. Can, um, uh, can you describe how this robustly Trinitarian Christological theology can get heard by the people who actually feel more complicit in the crucifixion of the people today versus being Sabrino or, or these theologians who are the ones who give voice and articulation of the crucified? What's like the helpful prophetic way that as theologians, as ministers, as Christians, to hear the challenge of, uh, of, of Moltmann for, uh, for global communal politics. Here's the challenge. To dwell within a theology provides a kind of safety because whatever comes toward you, you've already interpreted you already know how to interpret, how, how to understand it. So my challenge is, Ray Anderson once said in a, in a famous, um, chapel talk, leave your crosses at the door. Don't come in dramatically bearing your cross and letting us all know what, what categories you think with. Leave your cross at the door and go to those places where oppression actually happens. The amazing thing about the Jesus of the Gospels is he doesn't carry the four spiritual laws in his pocket. He doesn't have a canned answer. I mean, I love the craziness of Mark 8, of a Jesus who meets a blind man in Bethsaida and walks outside the village completely alone. I mean, he's, got, he's supposed to bring about the kingdom of God. Where does he find the extra hour, right? Carries a blind, walks up with a blind man under a tree out in the countryside somewhere, right? Mixes spittle with dirt, wipes on his eyes, I mean, this is a guy who can snap his fingers to somebody who's not even in the room and the person's healed, yeah. right? He has to reapply it a second time, right? Imagine the amount of talking and the sharing that would go on. 
So set aside the framework, set aside the theology, and go to the place where you can find the reality of the need for love or the reality of oppression and be engaged there in a redemptive way. When you come home, you can add the Christian interpretation, as I also do at the end of the day. So when I wrote a book for China, it was about organic Marxism and not about the gospel. Can I come home and to a Christian audience say how I think those two are related? Yes. Did I need to give those words at that time? No. And so I think that's the challenge where your question takes me, Trip. Well, we're going to swap out the panel. Huh, we've been fired. But you're both... <laughs> You're both. You're both fortress. It's a Trump moment. You're both. You're, for, you're both fortress press authors. Do you want to tell us what your fortress press book is? Transforming Christian Theology. Uh, philosophy: A Short Visual Introduction. Both available in the Fortress booth, which you can visit between eleven thirty and twelve thirty on Sunday to have Jurgen sign your crucified God, either your old version or your new version, or both. He's asked us to sign our books too. Oh, is that right? Yeah, He's, you're going to sign it for him. That's great. Okay. So, get, Thanks, guys. Give them a hand and welcome Adam up here. I know Adam's here. Come on, Adam. And, and Jeffrey. Is, and Jeff, is, are Cynthia and Grace here? Yes. Cynthia or Grace? Because I'll, I'll abdicate my seat in a heartbeat. <laughs> Cynthia or C- Grace. Cynthia is in transition. Oh, all right. Her thing has wrapped up. She's moving this way. So that means as soon as she gets here, I'm I'm out. Yeah, we're gonna tap you out. But ah, hey guys, what's up? What's up? up? You're both uh, you're both authors in the Homebrewed Christianity Guidebook series. How's that feel? I mean, it is like the everyone has goals in life. It's the zenith of your careers, dudes. (laughs) Oh yeah. Do you want to introduce yourselves and tell us which which book in the series you're penning? Um, I'm Adam Clark, um, professor at, of theology at Xavier University. I am writing about salvation. I'm writing about salvation. I think Tripp named it. What's, what's, what's the title that you gave it? Uh, something I, about eternal. Oh, yeah, how to avoid etern- eternal conscious torment. Yeah, that's the <laughs> subtitle. Which I would like for you all to know that I do not support your eternal conscious torment. It's a guidebook. Uh, I mean, you got to give people how to. Right. I think I, I think I changed that a bit. I, I called it the fullness of life. As a, as mm, a that can be your working subtitle. But the, but the subtitle that's already on the cover <laughs> is how to avoid eternal conscious okay. torment. Okay. It's at the printer, baby. You know, uh, there's no going back. <laughs> and how about you, Jeffrey? What's your What's your station in life and your and your homebrewed book? My name's Jeffrey Pugh. I teach at Elon University in North Carolina, and the um, the book that they asked me to write was on the end times. Yeah, yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we have a new chart for you. It's gonna. The uh, subtitle uh, is "Theology After You've Been Left Behind." Theology <laughs> after you've been left behind. Now, I it's really like we don't have Adam's book yet, but I'm editing your book currently, yes. and I love it. It's hilarious. Wow. And you were like you were like in an end times cult in the seventies, bro. That's like awesome. Yikes. Who wasn't? Wow. <laughs> I know, like Larry Norman and shit. If you yeah. If you were in the seventies, you were in an end time cult. That's in, Is that in right? Front. If you went to church. <laughs> That's the case. Yes. Um I had a a, a, a short sojourn in the children of God. Oh, so man. Family of love, holler. Okay, so. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. Religious prostitution, anyone? Anyone? Oh, so. Yeah, no, what were they? What was the other word? The flirty other? little fishies. Yeah, f- flirting fishers. You've read that Mo letter. You've read that Mo letter. It's what, flirty fishers of men because yeah. they, they slept people into the kingdom, kind yeah. of? Yes, in fact. Does that work? This happened after I left. <laughs> <laughs> Which just constitutes another one of my issues of bad timing, I suppose. <laughs> <clears throat> what? <laughs> Do, let, let me ask you, you, you're, you guys have both endeavored to write. It, it's, it, writing... We've had a few beers out here tonight. Yeah, I, it's okay. I hear that. They couldn't giggle when Motma was talking. They can giggle now. Yeah, you'd get grounded. Writing writing a guidebook 
with no footnotes that's that's 35 or 40,000 words long with funny stories in it. It's not something that this guild that we're all meeting at really um, nurtures, really um, uh, incentivizes. So, like, what what got the two of you at two different stages of your career? Like, what what got you over the line to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a book for Trip. I'm going to throw in with Trip. On my hat's in that ring. Look, you should go first because huh? you actually wrote the book. <laughs> you haven't I, written yet. Uh, yeah, my, my, I'm in still the recipe for spit stage here. Yeah, I still got yeah. the ingredients out and still. But you signed it. the contract, so you're. I, I did. You got some skin in the game. Oh, I did. I did sign a contract. And how but, come? Like, what's the what's the what's enticing? Well, other than to you? my good looks. What's enticing <laughs> to you about about writing theology for the people? Well, first of all, so much of academic writing is not accessible. So part of the the effort is trying to translate, and also there are a lot of uh, people who. Doctrinal theology, even confessional theology, is kind of in, in crisis in, in, in a certain sense in terms of its ability to co- kind of convey meaning. So the challenge is to try to make um, traditional Christian concepts translatable to a really radically changing and pluralistic public and find new stories and images that are attractive and viable and relevant to our kind of current context. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that helps us stay sharp because I'm an undergraduate teacher and it's, it's, it, I want to relate to my students, the 18 year olds and 22 year olds and really trying to engage them in a way that is compelling and transformative, hopefully. Yeah, for me, I was just old and, and I was looking for a retirement plan. I hope it's going to sell a lot of copies. Oh yeah, no doubt. There's, so, there's a lot of money in theological books. Um, <laughs> Oh, let me tell you about Eric Metaxas's bond. Oh yeah, biography. That's, that's not theology. <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> right? Am I right? Did I, I get a what? I, what? Am I, I did not say that. Um, the the serious the serious. I mean the the thing that excited me about it was to be a part of a new theological genre, snarky theology. Yeah, right. Um, You've I've, written some books before. Have you ever written a book that can actually fit in someone's back pocket? Um. I think Devil's Ink might. Oh, it might. Okay. So yeah. with Fortress Press. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks Atta for boy. those French flaps, Fortress. Um, so <laughs> the the serious part, though. I mean, and if you'll remember, last year we were at the reception, and I I may have had a couple of beers, a couple of beers, and we were running down the list, and you know, you guys were like going Christology, and thinking, ah, you know, ecclesiology, ah. and then you went end times, and I went. Booyah! Um, that's who the doesn't one I want. say booyah when it gets to end times. So, <laughs> that's the one I want. Only the because, because, as I say in the book, over thirty million. I mean, the polls are showing over thirty million people in America are living out of a false sense of consciousness about what the return of Christ means, or what I believe to be a false sense of consciousness. Mm-hmm. The sort of um, premillennial dispensationalist. Um, I was taken in by that world briefly when I was a kid, but that doesn't that doesn't. Yeah. Amen. There's yeah. another one. It's a recovery program. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, so um, so I just thought if I could write a book that might somewhere have a person read that and go, you know, I don't have to think like this because this is kind of a prison of thought and it does not lead to a and I want to say this in relationship to the sort of very erudite theology we've been talking about a sense of hope it leads to something else entirely so one of the things that I was thinking about just in the whole process of writing the book um, of editing the books and talking about it Grace and I have talked a whole lot about your book I've read each version thus far, and um, I, and y- y- you are like, oh, this is difficult to write for n- normal people. You should just ask to see Tony's emails to me during the process. <laughs> there are like three amazing chapters about ontology and Christology that didn't get in. Because he wanted me to talk about like Jesus. Um, and in 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 the uh, in the most recent draft of your book, you actually kind of like describe in wrestling with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, 
something extremely practical and obvious the moment you decide to attend to it. Namely, that the church, in giving a guide, you're actually introducing them to a doctrine that just like eschatology, the most popular version is like the world's worst eschatology of all time. But the Holy Spirit, it's like that person of the Trinity you neglected got one line in the creed and no one cares about. <laughs> um, so I mean, even with the salvation, right? It's like when they say salvation, you mean like how the father kicked the shit out of the son so that we could go home with him for dinner? Like, so like the common doctrines like the common expression of them are so like i don't toxic. talk about that i don't talk about that i just want to yet yet that yet. was true i think you know there is so much to say about the holy spirit and i'm trying to like put it down into more <laughs> more um colloquial or i don't know yeah. for the people theology yeah. for the people and that's really hard for but me. it's I'm, hard because there's something <laughs> That, uh, like that's not a muscle that a lot of academics yeah, exercise. And, and, yeah, because every note is like they're not going to know which theologian you're talking about. Because if I just put in a name, you don't like it. So it's this whole process of rewriting the whole thing. You know, every time I'm writing a book, it's a painful process. But I know when it's done and out, I know I'm going to be very happy with it. Well, one of the things I, I, I'm really interested in, especially really the book, is how the doctrine of the spirit is one of those that in its – in the way we've neglected it, we've neglected one of the most vibrant avenues for the church to include uh, voices that decenter Eurocentric theology. It's like we oh, imagine yeah. Eurocentric uh-huh. theology is called theology, and everything else is an elective. And like <laughs> the, yeah. the like, your book like puts it right there on the page, and someone goes, "Oh yeah, like I guess I'm Eurocentric 101, but I didn't know there was other things." And, oh, the Holy Spirit's, like, actually part of the Trinity and matters. Ooh. Yeah, so, yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to kind of criticize the Eurocentric. And I know I think I'm being too harsh. And I think Tony, you know, through all the <laughs> all the editing, you know, he's saying this is. So I'm trying to rewrite it so that it's not so harsh. But I think uh, pneumatology, um, any of the theological discussion has been very Eurocentric. So I try to introduce new terms to understand the Holy Spirit. So one of my book, um, previous book is called The Holy Spirit, She and the Other. So I try at the end of the book, we were going to first put it at the beginning of the book. And then I think it might be too shocking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're going to work our way to it at the end of the book. <laughs> so introducing chi spirit, which is a very Asian term, but I think that for me, it's very helpful in the way um, when we talk about the spirit, um, Eurocentric was like, it felt so philosophical. It was kind of something out there. But when we talk about chi, so if you're not familiar with chi, if you go to Taekwondo, they talk about chi. If you go to Reiki, Tai Chi. It's a very embodied understanding of the spirit. So I think that then brings it down because, you know, people think I'm Presbyterian, but, you know, we're the frozen chosen. So we're kind of sitting there, but still we're filled with the spirit, but not in the way that, you know, maybe other people are filled with the spirit. So this embodied new understanding of this embodied spirit that's kind of within us and all around us and all of creation now I forget what the question was, but anyway. It's everyone else. The question Jewish. never really matters on okay. homebrew. You so just talk. This, yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's this embodiedness and that the spirit is with all of us. And I think it brings – I actually did another uh, taping today with Erdman's about why the spirit that I'm introducing is a little different. I think it's because – it was so philosophical. I'm trying to bring it down to the earth and that this is a way to kind of engage in dialogue, not just with Christians and not just with, you know, Presbyterians or Pentecostals, but worldwide global Christianity or with other religions or of other faith, because every culture, every religion have this understanding of the spirit. They may not use the word Holy Spirit, um, Numa or Ruha, but there is this understanding. So I think it's a really big, gateway i think something that we're not really dealing with and it's a globalized world and i think with the attack last week and in paris mm. people get nervous of who the other is and we we're gonna scapegoat everybody that doesn't look like the us or think like this but i think the spirit if it's 
um, really within all of us, this fundamental spirit that moves us and moves the world to be transformative. I know people were using transformative word, and I love the word transformative. Many of my book titles or something has transformative in it. So I think this is the way to go. So I think the Holy Spirit book is the most important book. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, so we need all of it, but I think it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to like move the world and move people to to do justice work and to to build the church and to build the reign of god so so when in thinking about we might get to to talk to y'all i i marked what would be the quote from the crucified god that all three of you would respond to completely differently related to the book you're writing this uh, is your benediction. You get to respond to this quote. Yeah, yeah. And close so, you know, there can either be nothing outside the text or you could con- ignore the text but convince us it was related. And then everyone's like, well, they have a Ph.D. It must be. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, so I have no German accent, but I'll read it nonetheless. Uh, Moltmann said, the crucified God is, in fact, a stateless and classless God. But that does not mean that he is an unpolitical God. He is the God of the poor, the oppressed, and the humiliated. There's a sense in which the entire word God is so debased. I, I, you know, I keep going back to Bonhoeffer's religionless Christianity and in the world we live with God um, and, and before God as if God does not exist. And there is a very real sense in which that word has become so debased because it's been so connected to triumphalism in every form, in every cultural form, in every construction of the state, in every construction of ecclesial communities. And so when I hear a quote like that, I guess the thing that that keeps coming back to me is that at that moment we, we remain silent and we position ourselves with the the humiliated. There's no other response. I, any language after that is is immaterial. It is up to us to incarnate that presence with with those. Um, what comes to mind when I when I hear that quote is that must that needs to revolutionize Easter for us. That. To me, if you take that seriously, that the God who was crucified is the God of the humiliated and the oppressed, how do you ritualize that, right? Like, wouldn't Easter be like a revolutionary holiday (laughs) for Christians? One that would kind of wake us up and actually, like, do, you know, um, have acts of service and acts of... uh, uh, emancipatory acts toward the poor and in solidarity with the humiliated. It seems to me that, that Easter would be more of a revolutionary work than just looking at Easter bunnies. Right? Well, that's, um, it's, you know, for me as a theologian, I'm always reimagining God and I think we have kind of created God um, and put God in a box that we're very happy with. So, and, you know, the God that we've worshipped is, I don't know, the God language is very difficult for me because it's so patriarchal, um, it's so white. Um, so for me, yeah, okay, are, is, are you agreeing with me? Okay, thank you, <laughs> if you are. Um, I think... Um, yeah, because of all that that has kind of come throughout 2,000 years of Christianity, the reimagining of our, our understanding of the crucified God, that's why I kind of bring in the spirit, because spirit is this neutral understanding of God. It's not this gendered God, and it's people all over the world have this understanding of the spirit. If you go to Hawaii, they greet you aloha the breath of God. You know, if you go to Africa, people have an understanding of the spirit. If you go to Asia, when we use the term chi, people understand that the spirit is among us and between us. So it's it's a very um, kind of a humbling experience to know that the God, um, the spirit God is with us, 
was on that cross and is with us in our suffering. So I don't know, it's, it's, that quote is so deep, I don't know, I'm still kind of thinking about it because my mind is run, rushing. And well, I'm going to take over the closing of this podcast to say it's, it's an incredible thing and it's an incredible gift, I think, to the church and to the academy that Trip has lined up authors like this to write theology without footnotes or, or minimal footnotes. Minimal. Minimal, just it's a like few. The book has as many as the first chapter that of your can fit in your back pocket that you can give to people you know and love. Right? It's fourteen ninety nine. It's like it is approachable theology, and that's a great. That's just a great gift. And I think that all of us who followed this podcast for so many years, uh, it's no surprise to us that Trip could pull off something like this. And you know, four of the ten books are represented right here, and. So it, it's going to be an amazing series for the couple thousand people who are watching online. I want to encourage you to go to homebrewedchristianity.com or tripfuller.com. You can even buy right now at a super reduced rate all 10 books in advance. You'll get them as soon as they come out, and you get all these other incentives, a special class with Trip, a coaster, a koozie, et cetera, et cetera. For those of you who are here tonight in the crowd – Trip is going to be signing books out there. I'd really encourage you to grab a copy of his book and have him sign it for you while you got him here in person, okay? Well, and the cool part is if they give me their email address when they buy it, they'll get Philip Clayton and I's Introduction to Religion and Science, Peter Rollins and I's Introduction to Christology and Radical Theology, and Philip Clayton and Scott Pace and I's Introduction to Moltmann's Thought and Walk Through the Crucified God. So even if the book completely sucks... You'll be like, that it was a high suck. quality $15 It's a, it's spent. a good book. No, you get a lot a of incentives. No, and I Fortress will feel good, and Phillips will feel good for buying all your beer and hanging out here. So you know what? Have another beer. Buy a book. Hang out a little bit. Thanks so much, everybody. And take pictures coming. with the cutouts. Take pictures. Okay. Tweet them out. Let's hear it up for Thank Trip you, Thank you, Andre. Thank you.